We're at Athelhampton House, a Grade 1 listed property in Dorset, built in the 1480s. Athelhampton has got everything you could wish for in an historic English country house and it's been described as one of the finest 15th century Tudor manor houses in England. Is it? Let's find out. The story of Athelhampton begins in 1485 when Sir William Martin was granted the right to enclose his estate and build a crenellated manor house, which became the seat of the Martin family for centuries. When you catch that first glimpse of an historic property for the first time, and you get that, ooh, blummy neck feeling because you can see immediately that it's got something special. That's exactly what you get here. So Athelhampton House was built in two phases and this is the oldest part of the house with this amazing gateway entrance complete with crenellations and it was built right at the end of the Wars of the Roses in around about 1485. Whereas this part of the house was built during the reign of Elizabeth I, so 70 years after that, you can clearly see the difference in architecture between the big Elizabethan windows that let in loads of light compared with the much smaller Gothic style windows in the older part of the building. I actually prefer the Gothic windows. I'm a big fan of the Gothic windows. I am as well, actually. So, what was it like to live in a magnificent Tudor house during the reign of Henry VIII? Well, the answer lies on the other side of this door. Coming to Athelhampton's Great Hall, you're immediately struck with this soaring ceiling, with this intricate Tudor woodwork. It's just an amazing piece of Tudor engineering, isn't it? It really is. You've got linen fold, oak panelling, Elizabethan linen fold, oak panelling, heraldic stained glass, and the majestic fireplace. You really it's have. just the beating heart of Athelhampton House, isn't it? It is. And at the head of the hall, you've got the raised dais, and this is where the Martin family would have sat together with any elite guests, and they would have been illuminated by the magnificent glass in the large oriel window because they were the most important people here. And when you're entertaining for the higher echelons of society, you've got the minstrels gallery. You've got up, to have up the up minstrels above. gallery. The, you know, you can just imagine the minstrels up there during celebrations and parties. Yeah, it's not a bad place for an evening meal, really, is it? It's not at all. Now the library here was once Elizabethan bedrooms and it holds a secret. Behind the wooden panelling lies a door which leads to the great chamber. It was built into the house by the Martins as a priest hall. The Martins were staunch Catholics and even though Catholicism had been restored by Queen Mary, there was always the risk that Elizabeth would reverse that when she took the throne because she'd been raised as a Protestant so, Sir Nicholas Martin incorporated a priest hole into his new west wing. This is it. So a priest hole was just a hidden chamber or compartment and they were used to conceal Catholic priests when practising Catholicism in England was illegal. The harsh reality was that when priest hunters turned up at the house, they didn't just spend a few hours having a nosy around and if they didn't find a priest, then they would leave. They would often stay for a few days and they would rip up the floorboards, they would rip out the panelling. And if they didn't find a priest, but they suspected one was there, then they may stay at the property for a week. 
sometimes even two. Meanwhile, the priest is in a small, cramped, confined space with very little oxygen and no food or water. While some priests might have had somewhere spacious to hide out, like this room here, that wasn't the case for many of them. If a priest was found, they faced execution for treason. But if you were found to be harboring a Catholic priest, then the consequences could be severe. So Nicholas Martin had four daughters, one of whom married this chap here with the rather magnificent beard. Now this is Chidick Tichborne. Chidick became involved in one of the best known episodes in Tudor history, the Babington plot. So Chidick, with a group of others and their leader, Anthony Babington, plotted to assassinate Queen Elizabeth and replace her with the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots. Now Elizabeth got wind of this plan thanks to her spymaster, Francis Walshingham, and Chidick was hung, drawn and quartered for his treason. As he was standing on the gallows, Chidick claimed, I am descended from a house some 200 years before the conquest, never stained till this, my misfortune. Chidick wasn't the only extended member of the Martin family connected with the Babington plot, but the authorities were more lenient this time, probably because Queen Mary's execution looked like a done deal, and because battle with the Spanish was expected, and the Martins owned a superb harbour at Weymouth, so they were much needed allies against the Armada. The Elizabethan kitchen here is one of the oldest kitchens in the country in continuous use. The archway is big enough for maybe a dozen cooks to be working at all at the same time. They're very similar in design to the kitchens at Hampton Court, although they are definitely not as big. So this part of the house is early Tudor, although the current decor dates from about 1891, which for England is relatively modern. Although it does have medieval stained glass windows and it does have an armada fire back in it. Its most famous diner was the novelist Thomas Hardy, whose father had been a stonemason at the house when Hardy was a child. Hardy was a frequent visitor here and he wrote many poems and novels that were inspired by Athelhampton. Athelhampton House is over 500 years old and unique in many ways and thanks to its current owner it's been brought right into the 21st century. This historic house is totally off grid and the property's entire electricity supply comes from solar panels. How amazing is that? This is something you don't see every day and it has to be the finest dovecot I've ever seen. Built in the 16th century, it had a very practical function to provide the best quality pigeon meat for the Lord's table. It would have housed well over a thousand pigeons and stands as a wonderful addition to the gardens. Welcome to the Corona, a really peaceful and tranquil area of Athelhampton's historic gardens. I really like the water fountain in I the middle. I love the water fountain. So this whole space is designed as a crown, topped with obelisks, and it really is the central heart of the gardens here at Athelhampton House. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's such a peaceful place to unwind on a lovely day like this. And what visitor wouldn't like coming to visit this amazing historic house? 
I'm relaxing here with a cup of tea. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Go and get me one. <laughs> OK, Joe, brace yourself, because up these steps is where you get transported into something out of the storybook. All right, are you ready for this? Yeah, go on then. Ladies first. Thank you very much. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, wow! Ta-da! <laughs> Welcome to the Great Court with its pyramid views. What do you think to this? I think he looks like something out of Alice in Wonderland, it does, doesn't, doesn't it? it? <laughs> you could just have such a good game of hide and seek in here, couldn't you? And you could just imagine the Queen of Hearts just popping out from behind one of these giant yew trees, couldn't you? I would not like to be responsible for the topiary in here. <laughs> What truly sets Athelhampton apart is its remarkable architecture. With its iconic Great Hall, stunning Tudor facade and sprawling gardens, this historic estate offers a window into the past like no other. 